Good evening. I am Shelly Ka, Vincent P. Adams, Rabbi Vincent P. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Ed's High M, along with my lovely wife, Navia Leslie Adams. Ed's High M means Tree of Life. And we want to welcome you here tonight to the eighth teaching in the eighth day of our Rosh Kadesh Nisan celebration. This is the year 50, the biblical year 5773. And on the Gregorian cal uh, calendar, it is, what are we? March 18th. March 18th, 2013. Okay. If you've been following us, and I hope you have been, we are kind of in a series on these past eight days. The first 12 days of Nissan, Nissan is the first month. And since it is the first month, it controls all of the other months following it. And the first 12 days of Nisan correspond to each month of the biblical year. So we have a rare opportunity during Nisan that everything that we do during these first 12 days will affect those corresponding 12 months. Nisan is a time of warfare. It's a time of elevation. It's a time that kings go to war. And it's a time of sacrifice and a time of praise and worship. So we have been doing all of those things on each and every day. We've been offering praises, sacrifices. We've been engaging in spiritual warfare. We've been engaging in blessings so that our entire year will be filled with the fruit of a, vict of a, a, a victory in battle. Uh, one preacher told me one time that there is no victory without the battle. And there's no spoils without the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. No victory without the battle and no spoils without the victory. This is a time where we can enter into battle and overcome the enemy. Because we want the spoils. Amen. Amen. And so we must we must enter into battle. We must enter into warfare. Because there is no spoils without the victory. And of course, no victory without the battle. So we are engaging in battle every day. You know, it's difficult to have a service uh, every single day for 12 straight days. We call it the Messianic Revival. Because before we can come before you, we have to get before the Lord. And that takes time. You know, you know some nights we've gone all night. Other nights we've gone almost to midnight. We're in the second half now. You know, we're on day eight. We just have four more days to go after this. But it's also a time of gladness and joy. So we enter into this battle not uh, as a drudgery or something, you know, as a burden. We, we enter it gladly. And we can declare the miracles of going forth, you know, transformation, at least in me. You know, I'm receiving my healing. I'm being transformed, praise God. You know, the seeds are being planted for my victory. And I will reap a harvest. And those of you who are doing the same along with us will also reap a harvest. Amen. Praise Amen. God. So we've been studying each month. Tonight, we're going to look at the month of Tishri, the month of Tishri. This is the seventh month in the biblical calendar. It is also the month where Rosh Hashanah occurs on Tishri 1. That's New Year's, oddly enough. And on Tishri 10 is the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Some of the rabbinical uh, fathers say that this is the uh, greatest day in the, the festival. And on Tishri 15 is the Moed or feast day or appointed time of Sukkah or Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. So we have three, you know, these are called the fall feasts. We have three major feast days in this month. 
So this is a, a, a very special month. And we have clues that, you know, like I said, if this is um, kind of part eight in this, you know, whole thing, or uh, see, really part seven, part seven, this day eight, part seven, we're a day behind in putting up uh, day eight, which is today, today, this evening, corresponds to chess fan. And we're uh, doing the teaching on Tishri. We'll probably do the teaching on Chess Van tomorrow, along with uh, Kislev uh, tomorrow also. Okay. But if you've been following us, and like I said, if you haven't, please go back and listen to part one, because I can't keep going over everything about uh, Rosh Kadesh and the new moon of, of every biblical month, every time. So go back and listen to part one, part two, part three, uh, part four, and, and part five and six, which contain uh, two teachings, the, the teaching on Av and the, the teaching on Il Elul. But this is a time where we can sow seed at the beginning of each biblical month that would have affect the entire month. Just as what we do on Shabbat affects the entire week. God kind of gives us spiritual warm wormholes that we can transcend space and time. That's I don't know about you, you know, but that that makes it a lot easier. You know, suppose we had to do this every single day to have an effect. It, it would be very time consuming, although we're to pray every day, but this is a, a special anointing, you know, to give an extra kick uh, to our prayers. Let me scoot over. Get a little bit more center okay. on, on the camera. But this is the month of Tishri, the seventh month in the biblical calendar. It is the, or I should say, the tetragrammaton combination of permutation for this month is Vav He Yod He. Vav He Yod He. The scripture where we find this uh, permutation is Genesis chapter 12, verse 15. Let's just. Go there very quickly, Genesis chapter 12, verse 15. The name of each biblical month gives us a clue to the character of that month, to the nature and the character of that month. And let me sort of sort of explain that. Uh, I uh, can't resist the temptation to cover some of the other material every night. Um, the, how, sh how, sh how should I put this? You know, in the church, you know, we have different denominations. We have, we have Catholicism, we have Protestantism, we have Orthodoxy, you know, sort of three main divisions of Christendom. Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy. We know that Catholicism, Catholicism is headed by the Pope and the Roman, you know, Catholic Church. Uh, the Protestant movement was started by Martin Luther, and from there we, you know, we have boy a myriad of denominations, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopal. Uh, getting ready to say Pentecostal. Boy, fire. You know, <laughs> eight days of spending six and eight days, I mean, six and eight hours a day with God, and, you know, kind of the flesh can't take it. And sometimes, you know, uh, 12, almost 20. But we have these different denominations. In the, especially uh, in the Protestant movement, you know, and, and uh, there are even certain divisions and sects in Catholicism and Orthodoxy as well. 
But one thing that kind of puzzles me is how in most of the other uh, divisions of Christendom and different sects of Protestantism, they don't believe that the gifts that the Shilly the Shilly Keen display in the Brick of the Shot of New Testament, the Shilly Shilly Keen are the apostles. They don't believe that the gifts are still available. You know that you can't. You know healing and miracles is went out at the time of the Shilly Keen, as they say. And I say, you know, that's just absolutely ridiculous. First of all, the Bible doesn't say that they went out. Number one, okay. And number two, if indeed they did go out at the time of the apostles, why do you even bother to pray? What does everyone pray for? They pray for a miracle. They, they, they pray for healing. If they're sick, they pray for healing. If they're broke, they pray, they pray for prosperity. Usually most people are either sick or broke most of the time. So most everybody is praying for uh, healing, prosperity, or protection at all times. Very rarely, uh, you know, are we praying, oh, bless your name, Lord. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're just so good. As we okay. Like, as you say, like we should. Most times, you know, we're, we're praying for prosperity. We're praying for provision. We're praying for sustenance. We're praying for favor, you know, to get this job, to get into this university, to get to be accepted into this training program or that school or, you know, heal me, heal my body, heal my children, heal my mother, heal my father, heal, you know, or protect us from, you know, whatever. Grant us safety, Lord. Grant, you know, grant, help us. We're in desperate times. But if you don't believe in miracles, if you believe they went out during the time of the Shilakim, why are you even praying? The Bible in the Brick of the Shah says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot have faith in something that is random or maybe. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? If you got up and went to school every morning, and some mornings they were open and you had classes and some mornings you went and they were closed, you would you probably would get up every morning and go. You would try to second guess it. You, know, you can't have faith for something that's random. For those of you who have a job and the payday is maybe every Friday, or every two weeks every every Friday, or maybe you get paid on the 1st and the 15th, whatever. If you went to work and you're supposed to be paid that Friday and you didn't get paid, whether you, you know, get paid once a week, two weeks, 1st and the 15th, 1st and the last day of the, you know, or the last day of the month or whatever, guess what? You probably will not get up and go to work every day because you don't know if you're going to get paid. You can't have faith for something that is random. You can only have faith for something that is assured. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. The evidence of it, meaning you receive it. You receive it by faith. You're going to get it. It has to be something that you can depend on, something that you can count on. I remember when I um, I applied for a job, I sent out resumes to several different companies. I wanted to relocate from the Washington, D.C. area to New York, New York, New York. And I got three job interviews, three invitations to come in for an interview with three, three different firms in Manhattan. 
And I had really been praying before I, you know, even before I sent off the applications, you know, I didn't have a job. I had um, resigned my position. Like I said, I wanted to relocate. So I fasted for three days. And, and during those whole three days, no food, just water, I fasted. And I, I prayed and I just read the Bible all day for three straight days. No TV, no food. You know, if I got tired, I just went to sleep. When I woke up, I just read the Bible and prayed for those three days. That's all I did for three days. And when I, when I went to New York, I was so full of faith. And I was so confident that I was going to, you know, receive a position. You know, I remember walking around Manhattan. Manhattan. It was the first time I'd ever been to New York. And I just walked around like I owned the place. <laughs> had my suit coat on and, you know, my cashmere overcoat. You know, I looked like a Wall Street warrior. You know, I was just, this, this is mine. Yeah. You know, there's an old saying that if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. You know, that's the top of the line. I felt that, you know, hey, I'm ready for the big time. I'm ready for the big show. If I can get a job here and make it here, nothing can stop. Me. Nothing I sit out to do will be uh, a hurdle or a stumbling block. So I just, you know, I was supremely confident. I was just full of faith. So I had the three interviews. I, I felt that I did very well on each interview. As I said, I had three. And so I went back to DC and you know they said they would have a decision in, in about two weeks. So I remember I called up the different firms about two weeks later. And one firm said that this, uh, I called the first firm, firm and they decided that they would not offer me a position. And I, what? <laughs> I mean, I actually expected to get a position that I would be able to choose and pick and choose, that I would get get three offers. And I was absolutely stunned that they didn't offer me a position. How can that be? You know, I almost want to say, are you sure? Really? You don't want to hire me? Mm -hmm. Have you lost your mind? I really felt that way. I, I mean, I just, I was stunned. That's all right. I called the second firm. It be, I, I don't know if, if, if I called and got two no's right in a row or what. I can't remember for sure. But one of the firms that I interviewed with, with did offer me a position pretty close to the salary that I, you know, was requested. And then, you know, the third one uh, firm did not offer me, you know, I was really shocked again. But at the same time, how many did, how many offers did, how many jobs did I need? I could only do one. So my faith brought, my faith brought in what was needed and what was, you know, required and desired, a job in New York at this salary in my profession. I'm a commercial real estate analyst and appraiser. So that's all I needed. But I was just stunned that, you know, two out of three said no. That's faith. When you pray for something and it doesn't happen, you should be like, what? Lord, I, wait a minute. You want me to wait a little longer, right? And some, um, we should, you know, we should be totally expected to receive what we pray for. Otherwise, why pray? That's not faith. If it can't be depended upon, it's not faith. So how can you say miracles have gone out? 
with the Shilakim. You can't pray for a miracle. You can't pray for healing. And all, you know, I'll tell you this much, let a Baptist get sick. They'll pray for healing. Let a Presbyterian get sick. They'll pray. Let a Methodist get sick. They'll pray. They'll all pray. What for if you don't believe in miracles? If you believe it's just something, you know, if it, it's just if it be his will. If it be his will, you just, you don't have to pray. It's, just, it's going to happen, right? You know, why pray? You know, it, it's, you know, faith has to be, you cannot pray in faith if you think it may not happen. You've just defeated your prayer. Now you may say, what does this have to do with the study of the biblical months in Rosh Kadesh, the first day of the biblical month. By studying the biblical month and the nature and character of each month, we understand how Yahweh interacts with us and what we can pray for. And when it is appropriate to pray for it. I heard one teaching one time from a preacher. He said, you know, if we would get in line with God's will, if we would pray for God to reveal his will to us, and then get in line with his will, instead of begging God to get in line with our will, we would receive more answers to our prayers. Amen. We would have more of our prayers answered successfully. Amen. Now, doesn't that make sense? Yes. Get in line with God's will and what God is doing. Instead of begging and pleading and fasting for God to get in line with our will. That's the reason why sometimes, you know, some of our prayers go unanswered. We're not in line with God's will. We're begging God to get in line with us. Give us what we want, where we want it, when we want it, and how we want it. And it may not be in his will. Or the timing may be off. By studying the biblical months, we can learn what God's will is for that season, for that month. The biblical months give us clues to God's will for that time of the year. And if we can, we can get into that cycle, we'll have all the blessings. We'll have the answered prayers successfully that we want. Studying the biblical months helps us get in line with God's will and the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. It helps us get in line with his movement so that it is effortlessly rather than begging him, come over and bless this, please, you know, you know, fighting, you know, to break through. The study of the biblical months will do that. It'll help us get in line with his will. The way that we get in line with his will, the way that that happens, each biblical month has a name. The name gives us a clue as to what that month is about, as to what the move of God is for that month, as to the nature and character of that month. The name of that month will give us a clue. God's will for that month. The other thing that will give us a clue to God's will for that month is the name of the twelve of, of the of the tribe of one of the, each month is assigned one of the twelve tribes. Mm -hmm. The name of that tribe 
will give us a clue as to that month as well, as well as the nature and character of that tribe. When we read the Bible, when we read the Torah, the first five books of Moses and other scriptures, primarily the Torah, we get an idea of what each particular tribe is about. We know from, from studying what that particular person did, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, we get an idea. What did they do? What was their character and nature and their personality like of this individual person or of this tribe? Or we look at a leader, a particular standout of that tribe. That gives us a clue as to the nature and character of that tribe and the nature and character of that particular month. So we studied the nature and character of the tribe. We studied the nature and character and personality of an individual standout leader of that tribe in the biblical narrative well as the, the nature and character of the name of that month. So we look at the name of the month, we look at the name of the tribe and what it means, we look at the nature and character of the tribe itself, what did this tribe do as a whole, and then we look at an individual standout member of that tribe and what he did. And we get ideas as to the nature, we get clues and glimpses into the will of God for that time and for that season. Therefore, we can get in that flow and just get carried into our blessings. So that's why we, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. I, I just haven't gotten to that point yet. Also, each, each month is assigned a constellation and a planet that rules that constellation. The nature of that constellation, what we know, you know, you know, we call it biblical astrology. What we know about that particular constellation gives us clues into the nature and character of the month and what anointings are available or what needs to be overcome, what we have to be on guard for and the planet that rules that constellation. What is the nature and character of that planet from astronomy? So we look at, you know, physical manifestations of the constellations and the planets are the result of spiritual forces at work. Moon does what it does because there is a spiritual force behind it. Mars has a spirit, a spiritual force. Mm -hmm. Mercury there's a spiritual force. Jupiter there's a, a, a physical force, a spiritual force that manifests itself as a physical phenomenon. So we need to study not only biblical astrology but also astronomy. And I call it biblical astronomy because there is a spiritual force. We study the laws of physics that govern each planet. What is the physical nature of these planets? Why do they do what they do? Why do they behave the way they do in terms of their orbits? The number of days they take to surround, uh, to orbit the sun the physical characteristics. Physical characteristics represent spiritual forces. And those spiritual forces control or dominate or influence the months that they are associated with. So all of these things give us clues as to God's will. Also, there are letters 
that are associated with those with each constellation and with each planet. The Hebrew letters made one Hebrew letter made this particular constellation, another Hebrew letter made this planet. We look at those Hebrew letters. The Hebrew letters have a nature and a characteristic and a spiritual force all their own. So we study the nature and character of each letter also to reveal to us what the will of God is for this season. Each letter. Aleph Bay. Those letters are alive. Also, each month has a tetragrammaton permutation, or when you permute, you know, permutate the tetragrammaton, it can be permutated in twelve different ways. Each one of those permutations is associated with a, a biblical month of the year, and the order of that permutation also gives us clues as to the will of God. nature and character of that month. I think this is as detailed as I've ever given it during the past uh, seven days. So we look at all of these things, the letters of the planets and constellation, uh, constellation mm -hmm. the tetragrammaton permutation for the month, yod heh vav -Heh. The name, that's our covenant name of God. Our blessings flow through that name into us. When we rearrange those for each month, it signifies a difference. So we look at all of these things. It requires quite a bit of study. I'm only scratching the surface of it during these 12 days, during the past seven days so far. And you know, eighth day tonight and four more days after this. I'm only going to scratch the surface of it. But it's, what, I'm, what I'm digging up, though, is extremely deep and extremely profound still. And I'm just scratching the surface of it. So with that introduction, let's uh, move on to tissue. The tetragrammaton in combination for Tishri, as I said, is vav he yod he, found in, Gen in Genesis chapter 12, verse 15. Let's read verse 15, Genesis 12, 15. The, prince, the princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now this is referring to Sarah, Abraham's, Abraham's wife. He had left the Holy Land. He had left Israel because of a famine in the land of Israel. So he was afraid of starving. He didn't have enough faith to stay in Israel. You know, God told him that that was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey for him. But a famine hit the land, so he left. So that was a sin. He didn't have enough faith. And he went into Egypt, and Sarah was very beautiful. So the men of, of Egypt saw and told Pharaoh how, how beautiful she was. And so Pharaoh said, hey, bring her here. Plus the fact that uh, Abraham had lied and told Sarah, say, don't say that you're my wife. Say that you're my sister so the men of Egypt won't kill me and take you from me. So he lied. He didn't, he didn't have enough faith in Yeshua. Enough, well, he didn't know Yeshua, so he didn't have enough faith to believe that he could survive a famine in the land that God promised him. And then he didn't even have enough faith to own Sarah as his wife. So Pharaoh came and sent for and, and took his wife into, you know, in his house. So you say, well, what does that have to do with Tishri? The Talmud tells us that the time that Sarah was taken into uh, the palace of Pharaoh was actually Pesach Eve. 
We know, you know, from reading the rest of the narrative here that God sent a plague on Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh finally figured out that, you know, when he saw how Abraham was, he, the Bible said, the King James Version said, sporting with her. He said, that's your wife. That's not your sister. He said, why didn't you tell me that was your wife? You brought a plague on us. You brought a curse against us. So he immediately sent Sarah back to him and also sent gifts to atone for taking her. So when Abraham left Egypt, he left financially, you know, endowed and set up. But because he did not have enough faith to stay in Israel, and because he lied, he put a curse on his generations to come. Because now his descendants were going to have to go in to Egypt. The same reason, you know, the 12 tribes, Jacob's 12 sons and all their families, they went into Egypt because there was a famine. And they were taken captive when they went into Egypt. But God brought plagues upon Pharaoh at that time. And when they left, they left with the gold and silver of Egypt. The fact of, you know, of the matter is, we repeat what our forefathers have done. Yes, we do. Now, the connection with Tishri here is Pesach occurs in Nisan. So the first month of the year, which is a new year, and the seventh month of the year, Tishri, which is also a new year, have, have this connection. The tetragrammaton and permutation and combination for Tishri is found in this verse. Four consecutive words that have the beginning that they begin with Vav, and then the second word begins with Hey, the third word begins with Yo, the fourth word begins with Hey. So we get a clue from you know we get a clue here from this verse as to what's going on. In Tishri. Tishri is connected with Nisan, the new year. Okay? So we get we get that connection. We get the connection, and from that we can deduce that Tishri is going to be a prosperous time. Just you know, because Sarah was taken in on Pesach Eve. Then when she was released. They came out with great substance. Just as in Nisan, Nisan is the month of the Exodus. It's a month for redemption. It's a month for renewal. It's a month to expand, to be increased. It's a month that you should be financially enhanced. And we get all that from this scripture and the connection of this scripture with the month of Nisan. You know, that's why that's why it's important to read the Talmud. Because, you know, I've always heard for years, they say, well, you know, if you just read the written Torah, you really only have part of the story or just half of the story. It's important that we, you know, when we look at all of the miracles, in the Bible, especially in the Torah, they always occur during these feast days. Hello, is, is that telling you something? Yes. If you can get in line with God's feast days, you get in line with his miracles. You get in line with his will. All, you know, 
Pentecost, what the church calls Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. When the, you know, the Holy Ghost came, when the Ruach HaKodesh fell on the apostles, the Shilakim, it came down like, you know, cloven tongues of fire and rested on them. That happened during Shavuot, the feast day of Shavuot, mm -hmm. the day that the Torah was given to the Jews at Mount Sinai. God always does things on his I mean, I'm not saying every single miracle that ever happened in life happens on, but the majority of them, when we read them, it, 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 uh, the overwhelming, or maybe all, occurred on these appointed, the Moeds, the appointed times, the feast days, Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, all of them. When we know that and we get in line with that, miracles can break out in our lives and in our situation. And it's important, you know, many times, you know, the scriptures, you know, the Torah doesn't tell us, it tells us the account of what happened but many times it doesn't tell us when it happened. Sometimes it does, sometimes we can deduce it mm -hmm. from a very careful study. But if we would read the Talmud, the Talmud would tell us. You know, Yeshua was conceived during Hanukkah. He was born during Tabernacles. He was crucified during Pesach. He rose three days later, which is called the Feast of First Fruits. Conceived on a, you know, conceived during a festival, born during a festival, died during a festival, rose again during a festival. And as many scholars believe, will come again during a festival, mm -hmm. probably during the time of the fall feast, either on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, or, you know, sometime during the fall feast or Sukkot. If we carefully read the Brick Hadashah, the New Testament, we find that most of, uh, of the miracles that Yeshua performed were on the, on the Sabbath, on the Shabbat. Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. You mean to tell me you want to change that to Sunday? When we read in the Bible that all of these miracles were done on Shabbat, even many of the other miracles were done, done dur during feast days. When he healed the blind man and he said, he said, I'm the light of the world. And then he healed the blind man. It was during the festival of lights or Hanukkah when the temple would have been filled with nine branch menorahs and all these lights. They called it the festival of lights. So during the festival of lights that Yeshua was honoring and observing, he said, I'm the light of the world. Then he turned around and healed this man of blindness. Boy, the Pharisees were mad at him. He says, I'm the light of the world. And then he heals someone of blindness <coughs> that's never seen light, that can now see light. What did Yeshua say? You know, people say, well, why can't you just do things like Yeshua did? I am. Exactly what I'm doing. What did Yeshua say? I only do what I see my father do. Father tends to do things on Shabbat and on the festivals and the feast days. I only do what I see the father do. That's a clue. We should only be doing and asking what we see the Father do. I've been to a lot of uh, healing revivals. And one thing that I've heard as a common thread from the people, you know, conducting those uh, healing services and healing revivals 
is that they will say, I asked the Holy Ghost, what is, what is he, you know, doing tonight? What does he want to do tonight? You know, somebody with cancer of the liver may not be healed during this particular prayer meeting because, you know, the Ruach Hokades is healing cancer, you know, uh, you know, lung cancer that particular night or day. I've heard many of them say that, that they just get in the flow of what the Ruach is doing that night. And every, every particular illness may not be healed on that particular night. You know, if, if you know, take note if you ever watch film of, you know, healings like that. They'll say, you know, the Lord wants to heal people of spinal problems tonight. The Lord wants to heal people of uh, uh, cancer of the throat tonight. You know, and they'll name specific illness, illnesses a lot of times. They get in flow with that. And when they get in the flow with that, that increases their faith. And it increases the flow of the people because the first few healings are done easily. And then once those healings are done and the people's faith are now built up because they've seen people get healed of this and healed of that, now some of the other diseases can be healed because faith has been, the anointing has been built up through faith. But sometimes just those things that the Ruach tells the man of God, you know, to call forward, are healed. But he, he, he or she at least does that first. What is God doing right now? Let's tap into that first. Let's be obedient to that first. Then maybe there's enough of anointing here to handle some of the other things too once the faith of the people is ele is elevated so the study of the biblical months help us to understand you know to know what the ruach is saying at this time so we can get in that flow for healing each month also uh, corresponds to a body part Does that mean that that body part can be healed during that month? Maybe. I haven't gotten that deep into the study. I don't, you know, but I, I plan I plan to to get there. Each of the twelve months also refers to a body part, and that also, or or one of the five senses, a body part, or one of the five senses, or both. Tammuz is, is the month of hearing. No, excuse me, of seeing. So perhaps uh, praying for, you know, for the blind would be good during Tammuz. Av is the month of, of the sense of hearing. So maybe perhaps praying for the deaf during the month of Av is, uh, is good. Tishuva during Elul. We usually repent with what? The mouth. Maybe praying for someone who has faculties of speech impaired is good. I'm only suggesting. I, I, I haven't read that anywhere, but, you know, I'm going to be before God. You know, when this little series of 12 days are over, I'm going to really delve into study of the biblical months and what's associated with each month body parts, you know, I, I think, I feel in my spirit, I, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought about this until right now, that the body parts that are associated with each month also are the body parts that the Ruach Hokadesh wants to heal during those months. In Nissan, I'm doing my research on Nissan, um, not on Nissan, on um, Iyan. ER is the month of the stomach. And the rabbinical literature said that 
pranks that heal are particularly effective, more effective than heal. Pranks, not food, not injections, but drinks. You know, that's the month to take your vegetables and your fruit and your herbs and, you know, grind them up in a blender and drink them because it's the month of the stomach. So, you know, these body parts, I'm sure, you know, I really feel in my spirit. Even when I read, you know, when I read that, I didn't think about, okay, God wants to heal the stomach during uh, the month of ER. Yeah, uh, but now it just popped into my to my spirit while we were, you know, while we're sitting here talking. So it is, you know, for healing, for everything, we need to know these things. We need to know the nature. What other things are we going to, you know, learn from the study of, from a deeper study of the months? You know, woo, it's powerful. Nice. Not just some esoteric teaching, okay, all right. But we, we need to be able to, you know, to have teaching that transforms and changes our lives. The tribe associated with Tishri is Ephraim. Eph Ephraim. The word Ephraim means to be fruitful. Fruitful. And let's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring up the scripture. First scripture is uh, Genesis 41, 52. Ephraim was the second son of uh, Joseph. And the name of the second son he called Ephraim. For God have caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So this is a time to be, Tishri is a month to be fruitful in, in the midst of affliction. It's a time to prosper. What happened during peace art? You know, they were they they were in bondage, but they prospered out of that bondage. Sarah, what was the other scripture from Genesis uh, from Genesis 12, 15? Sarah was taken into bondage during Nisan, during Pesach Eve. But when she came out, she came out prosperous, she came out more fruitful. So it's a time to be fruitful. It's a time, even in the midst of affliction, it's a time to be fruitful and be enhanced and be increased financially. History is. History. Nissan also, but that's the connection between, okay. there's a connection between um, Nissan and Tishri. You know, it's a symbiotic connection there. So, Tishri is a time to be fruitful, as the name implies. How do you be fruitful in a time or in a circumstance of affliction? What do you have to have? What must you be to be fruitful and multiply in a time of affliction? Yeah, you need nourishment, but let me see if I can get you. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. In a time of affliction. Desire. Desire. Okay, when you have desire, what else do you have? You're kind of coming down the, the right track. Not, you haven't pulled into the station faith. yet. Faith. Faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a word I'm looking for with that faith. If you have faith, what, you know, what do you have? Yeah. yeah but when, when I talked about when I talked about how I was in New York, what else did I have? When I said I was walking around New York like, like I owned it. Confidence. Okay, you said confidence. What does confidence, what's another word for confidence? In a way? Certainty. Huh? Certainty. certainty. What's another word for confidence and certainty? Faith. And faith. What's the, 
you know, if, if you're confident, you're certain, and you have faith, what does that trans, you know, trans, you know, lead into or, or transpire into? Action. Action. What does it take to take action? Okay. Yeah. I'm looking. I, I just want you to say a word. What? Power. Power. Yeah. It. It. You know. Power will manifest out of that. Yeah. What? Pride. No, not so much. That's so not pride. That that pride. Oh, drive. No, drive. That's all confidence, man. Yeah, that's that's another word for the word. I'm looking. I'm just hoping someone will say the word. Courageous. You know, if you have faith and you have confidence, faith. If you have faith, that will give you confidence. If you have confidence, faith, and drive. That'll make you courageous. Right. Remember I said that when you're studying um, the monks, you look at the tribe of that monk and what the name of that tribe means, what the name of that monk means. Okay, we've done that. We've looked at the tribe. We've looked at the net, you know, be fruitful from mm -hmm. Ephraim. Okay, we've looked at that. We didn't look at the name. I also said you need to study an outstanding member of that tribe right. to see, you know, the. I know you won't know who the outstanding member is because I didn't know it either until I was, uh, you know, at least, if, you know, I've read it, but, you know, it wasn't in my memory because I didn't think it was important because I have a Christian worldview when I read the scripture instead of my, you know, the, the view of my ancestors, you know, a Jewish worldview. Remember, everything that's in the Bible is there for a purpose. God is intensely purposeful. There is not one word in there that you shouldn't take the greatest note of. One of the greatest sons of the tribe of Ephraim was Joshua. Joshua was very courageous. Joshua was one of the 12 spies. You know, there was, there was a spy from each tribe. Mm -hmm. And only Joshua and Caleb gave a good report. Joshua was the right-hand man of Moses. He took over for Moses upon Moses' death. And he, you know, we talk about what Joshua did. We call those the books of the conquest. You know, what did Joshua say? You know, behold, you know, go up, you know, take the land. But, but be ye very courageous. Mm -hmm. Joshua was, was, was that man. He was very courageous. So this is a time to be very courageous and go up into the land and possess it. Be fruitful. It's a command. We ought to go, you know, we ought, we ought to go and Take it. We should have faith that we're going to be successful during this month. We should go forward. We should, you know, start our business endeavors. We should launch out. We should increase. Seek, seek in. We should be seeking increase during tissue. We should be seeking new lands. When we, you know, when we study, you know, uh, you know, we would we have to study the tribe of Ephraim, and then we have to study. Joshua, you know, the greatest son, and, and any other uh, person who's from that tribe mentioned in the Bible to see all of the characteristics. All, you know, this study is so broad, mm -hmm. so broad. You know, it's, uh, it's deep. So we, we learn something from the scripture that the tetragrammaton and combination is from, you know, Genesis 12, 15. We learned a little something there. Okay. Now, the tetragrammaton and combination itself. Vav, hey, yo, hey. What do we learn from that combination? Just like in Av. Remember the combination in Av. The first two letters, you know, Nissan 
the combination is yod heh vav -Hey. And that's our covenant name. Our blessings flow through that name to us. So when the combination is yod heh vav -Hey, we know that that's a time of tremendous covenant blessings coming. And during, uh, what month was it? During Av, it was completely reversed. So we knew that that's a time of complete judgment. That Av or was that, was that the month of Av? Yeah, during Av. It's Hey Vav. Hey Vav, yo, hey. No. no. When's, when is it? Okay. During the month of Cancer. Mm -hmm. Two moves, okay. Two moves, I, I knew it was a month during, of judgment. So during the, the month of Two the tetragrammaton combination is Hey Vav, Hey Yo, which is the complete reverse. If we read it backwards, it's Yo, Hey Vav, Hey, which is what it should be for blessings to flow which is what it is in Nisan. In Nisan is yod heh vav -He, and to Tammuz, a month of judgment, is heh vav heh yod, mm -hmm. the reverse. So we know judgment is coming down during the month of Tammuz. We know that from the combination that it was in Av, judgment is coming. But in Av, it is heh vav yod heh. Only the first half is reversed, heh vav. Meaning, judgment is only coming during the first part. And from the 15th on, which is a traditional uh, festival celebration, we, you know, celebrate joy because the second half of the Tetragrammaton is yod Hey, is back in its proper order. So the first half of Av is judgment, and the second half is covenant again, covenant blessing. Now in the month of Tishri, the first half of the combination is vav He. It's reversed again. It's not in the proper order. But that's, that's not correct. Strike that. vav He is proper. The second half is in order. yo, yo he, but vav -he, it is in order. Yeah. So it is just the character is a a month of blessing. But there is a difference. Okay, it's split up. Because the first half, remember, is judgment. It's the day of atonement. But we also have the Feast of Trumpets. Yom, you know, Rosh Hashanah. So the first half is kind of a mixture. This is my interpretation. I need to do some more studying here. We know that the, there is judgment, but it's the type it's self inspection though. It's self. We should be judging ourselves so that we escape judgment, so that we can receive blessings, so that we'll be blessed on Yom Kippur, so that we'll be blessed. On Rosh Hashanah. And then the second half, yo, hey, okay, now we're perfect. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when the presence of Yeshua dwells with us. We have Simchat Torah, you know, the joy of the Torah. And we dance with the Torah as well. Mm -hmm. So we get an indication of the quality and nature of the month. There is judgment, but it is not the type of judgment that we see in Tammuz and Ah is the type of judgment that we should be pronouncing on ourselves. Self, you know, introspection, mm -hmm. a self-assessment in order to avoid harsh judgment so that we can enter into full joy beginning on the 15th when Tabernacles and Sukkot begin. We know that the uh, pay is the letter that uh, made the planet Venus, you know, which God of love, okay? And Lamed is the constellation 
that made, uh, and Lamed is the, the Hebrew letter that made the constellation of Libra. Lamed is the only Hebrew letter that extends above the line. So they said this is a time to draw down a superior level of anointing because this letter reaches up. Mm -hmm. So there is a higher connection available spiritually during this month through that, that letter line. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to end it there and let you take over with the usual on that. Would you get the, uh, the book and the deck of cards God. out of the library? <laughs> it's a silver gray book and there's a deck of cards that goes with it too. While he's getting that. Talk a little bit more about, you know, pay and, and Venus and Libra, you know. You need to do a deeper study on those letters to see what is, you know, the nature. And um, we know that Libra is about the scales and balance. What does that tell you? You know, when you have scales of balance, what are you doing? You're judging. Right. You're weighing. Okay, and judging. The uh, body parts for this month are the ears and the kidneys. The ears, they say, denote balance. We bring balance and symmetry, and symmetry to your face. Okay, and say the kidneys deal with emotion. Mm -hmm. I don't quite know what that means for this month, but the rabbinical literature said those are the body parts of this month. So perhaps this is a month to have your emotions healed or a month to, to control your emotions. You know, um, it's the seventh month. We know that month seven is a month of perfection. Right. Okay. My providence. Time to, you know, to start a ministry, start a business. Right. Weigh your deeds, your introspection. Um, pretty much, what I said it's a month of well balanced control. So you want to control your emotions during this month. That means healing has to come. In order to do that, you have to be healed in your emotions. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, perhaps is a month where the kidneys, if you have kidney ailments, you should be praying for your kidneys and praying for your your uh, sense of hearing and anything connected with uh, with audio. Right. Okay. Uh, names of God, you meditate on the three-letter combination of iron, race, and yo. Iron, race, and you. I know you can't. It is for absolute certainty. There's only one way to render all tombs and power in this work inoperative and worthless. It is called uncertainty. Remember it to be courageous. Right. In, in our insights and meditation of this, there's an uncertainty principle that they explain. A principle in quantum mechanics holding that increasing in quantum mechanics holding that increasing the accuracy of measurement of one observable quantity increases the uncertainty which other quantities may be known. Developed by theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg. Has some Inject doubt in any aspect of these teachings. Literally put, pull the plug and shut them down. Remember, 
If we inject doubt in any aspect of these teachings, we literally pull the plug and shut them down. They say, I'll believe it when I see it. it must be replaced by, I'll see it when I believe it. You have to switch that around. Most people want to say, I'll believe it when I see it. When I actually will see it. Remember, certainty is not just confidence that we'll get what we want. Certainty means recognizing that we are already getting what we need for spiritual growth. It is true that when hardship strikes, doubts begin to surface in our minds. So we become uncertain about the reality of the Creator, and we question the justice in the universe, and we fear for the future. We point the finger or of blame at others or toward the heavens, but when we invoke the power of certainty, all these negative sensations fade away like a fog shrouding a steadfast mountain. Every area of life, you want to say to me? I was just going to say, you can't have certainty without faith and courage. Correct. Courageous. And courageous, amen. Every area of life, the duration of chaos and pain is always directly proportional to the, our own degree of certainty and responsibility. Meditation on those letters, I ratioed. We meditate certainty, certitude, conviction, yeah. sureness, trust. All these fill my heart through meditation upon this name. Remember, the Hebrew letters are divine. You need to Amen. go to uh, our YouTube channel and watch my teachings on the Isle of Bay to know why we meditate on letters of the Hebrew alphabet because they're the essence of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, we'll end there. And as always, you know, may the blessings of Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach be upon you and may he watch over and guide you until we meet again. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.